Being a genie must be one of the most boring jobs. 10,000 years in such a cramped little lamp and nothing to do but wait for some schmuck to come rub it and tell you what to do? No wonder genie wanted out of that deal. As I'm sure you know, the genie was performed by the legendary and irreplaceable Robin Williams. We'll give some props to Will Smith. However, he was designed and animated by a very prolific animator. But who could have brought such an emotional and comedic character to screen? Let's find out. Eric Goldberg was born May 1st, 1955, and grew up in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Amber, that's really bad. I don't know if you should use that. As a child, Eric started watching theatrical shorts on TV, like Looney Tunes, and specifically, Woody Woodpecker, who would have a segment where Walter Lance would explain how animation was made. The exposure sheet gives us a complete description of everything we're supposed to see and hear. On this one, the scene opens with Woody in a chair. The kids come in, and the little girl says, Uncle Woody, tell us a story. It takes one, two, three, four, ten drawings for the word uncle. Then Woody starts here, and ends here. These shorts that would appear often on the Woody Woodpecker show influenced Eric in a big way. Later, he discovered flipbooks, and Eric began to teach himself how to animate. Uh, there was a sh uh, toy on the market called Flip Shows, where they took the frames of a Huckleberry Hound cartoon, put it on a perforated sheet, and you, you tore it apart, put it together, and you had a flipbook. And from that point in the house, uh, no memo pad was safe. You know? <laughs> yeah, Susan's there saying, still isn't safe. Um, <laughs> Uh, no grocery list, no shopping list, nothing, no laundry list, everything became a flipbook. So here are a few of my flipbooks from my high school years. This is how I really misspent my youth. Other kids were out playing baseball, I was making flipbooks. Other kids were going on dates, I was making flipbooks. <laughs> it's, it's a wonder I ever met Susan at all. Anyway, here we go. Eric attended Pratt University, where he majored in illustration. During college, he entered the Kodak Movie Festival and won the grand prize, which was a four-week course at USC. And honestly, with the way that student debt is, that's, that's like winning the lottery for an animation student. What's for sale? Why, all this, of course. 6,000 says it's yours. All right. 6,000 for what? Why, this, my friend, is whatever you want, lad. One snap of the fingers brings whatever locale you desire. Paris! <laughs> the Wild West!
<laughs> During his junior year, one of his friends told him about a job working for Richard Williams on the Raggedy Ann and Andy movie. Eric dragged all of his reels and portfolios in and got a job doing cleanup for Tisa David. Now, uh, Tisa was a great animator. She had been working for uh, John and Faith Hubley. Before that, she had been trained by Grim Natwick. She always used to quote Grim, you know, and, and I loved her dearly. She was, she was, you know, Grim always told me to look those both ways before we cross the street, and I've never forgotten that. Okay, thanks, Tisa. <laughs> and um, anyway, this is my first cleanups on Tisa's animation here. Don't worry now. Why? <gasps> oh. Well, uh. Look out below! All those, all the uh, swag, all those, yeah, all the hairs of yarn, all the polka dots drove me nuts. <laughs> Annie, you okay? Uh, 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 I'm okay. After the Raggedy Ann movie wrapped, Eric and some of his friends attempted to open an animation studio called Second Generation Animation. When that venture failed, Eric got an offer to work on Ralph Bakshi's Lord of the Rings. He called Richard Williams to get a letter of recommendation, and instead got an offer to join Richard in England to work on commercials. He took the offer and got an opportunity to work with a few animation legends. At the time, Dick was making The Cobbler and the Thief, and so he had grand elder animators over there working on it. And my first year there, Art Babbitt was over there working. And, um, you know, I'll tell you a few embarrassing stories, but first I gotta tell you this Art Babbitt story. Dick introduces me in dailies the first morning, and he goes, oh, this is Eric Goldberg, and he's looking for a flat, so if uh, anyone knows of a place that uh, he can rent, uh, let him know. And Art goes, are you looking for a place with a kitchen? <laughs> yes. Are you looking for a place with a toilet? Yes. Are you looking for a place with heat? Uh-huh. Spoiled American. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. Also there at the time was Ken Harris, who was one of my favorite animators, Chuck Jones' greatest animator. Uh, he got to I, I got to take him to lunch every Tuesday, so I would pump him for all sorts of uh, all sorts of uh, information. Uh, one time I would ask him, well, how come the, the Terry Toons and the Walter Lance cartoons weren't as popular as the Wal Warner Brothers cartoons? He's, and he would say, because they looked like crap. Um, <laughs> no bones there. And um, he was 80 years old and he could do 30 feet a week. And it was gold. It was Ken Harris gold, 30 feet a week. And I would say, well, how do you do it? And he'd go, oh, oh, hell, I don't know. Dick does all the poses for me, and I just follow that. And so I never got an answer, so I asked Dick. And Dick said, oh, well, he's a master of the charts. I said, what do you mean by that? And this is the single most important animation lesson I ever learned. He said, Ken knew exactly where to put one key, where to put the other key, and then instead of putting the break down dead in the middle and doing a slow out and a slow in, he would throw the break down askew. Say this is a dog's snout pointing downwards. So instead of an action that does this, he would go ahead and, and make the break down askew. And then when you put the in-betweens in with the exact same charting, you would get automatic overlap. And it's like, Oh, my God. At the end of Eric's four years stint with Richard Williams, while visiting New York, Eric met his wife, Susan, who was working in the background department at Xander's Animation Parlor. Eventually, the two got to work together in California on a TV special, Ziggy's Gift. Numerous cases of fraudulent individuals posing as street corner Santas have been reported making the public extremely wary. And now we take you live to 34...
Shortly after Ziggy, Eric got invited back to England to work with Oscar Grillo and eventually opened his own studio, Pizzazz Pictures, with two other partners, where they worked on various commercials. Meanwhile, Eric had made some important friends through his wife, Susan. While we were out in California in uh, 1982, uh, Susan, who had gone to CalArts, introduced me to a lot of her CalArts friends, like Daryl Van Sitters and Handel Butoy and Ken O'Connor and John Musker. So while I was in London, you know, John Musker and I would phone call each other every now and again uh, and kind of keep up a mutual admiration society. And um, he called me up to say that they were doing Little Mermaid. And I said, well, is it close to, uh, uh, you know, the original story? He says, you know, it's Disney, there's fish. Anyway, <laughs> that's about as close as it got. Um, but they started calling me from Disney, wanting to know if I wanted to jump ship and come and join them. Uh, and eventually, uh, I did. You know, I was getting stressed out working in London. Of course, Susan was quite comfortable. Hi, we're moving house, honey. And then she goes, ah, thank you. So anyway, she, uh, she's continued to support me through the years. And um, anyway, we moved back out to California. And my first gig was going to be the genie on Aladdin. I did not know that I was going to get the genie. They gave me the script to read. And I uh, said, well, John and Ron, and, and uh, well, why don't you see if there's a character that you like here? So I'm reading, and of course, John and Ron have a talent for being able to write in the voice of the actor they would like to cast. So the genie, clearly written for Robin Williams, is leaping off the page. And, um, you know, I go in a week later, and they go, and I'm thinking, oh, I hope I get the genie. I hope I get the genie. I hope I get the genie. And... Um, they go, well, we're thinking of you maybe for the genie. What do you think about that? And I'm going, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, working on that film was so much fun because we really put anything in it that made us laugh. John and Ron and I would listen to the soundtracks that Robin put down, laugh ourselves stupid, and the stuff that made us laugh the most got in the movie. Um, and Robin, bless him, is one of those guys who, who knew that I knew. In other words, he would do something vocally and he knew I would pick up on it, even if we didn't discuss anything at the recording stages. The most famous one was um, Robin's riffing. You know, he doesn't believe Aladdin is going to use his third wish to set the genie free. And he goes, uh-huh, yeah, right. Boop. And Ron and John don't know what boop was. And I said, well, that's Robin's shorthand for Pinocchio's nose growing because he thinks Aladdin is telling a lie. Ergo, can I please turn the genie's head into Pinocchio? We own the character. <laughs> and so it got in the movie and it got a huge laugh. Um, and it was that kind of great freewheeling atmosphere that I think uh, Robin really helped create for us because of his immense talent uh, that made it such a great, fun project to work on. I was the first animator on Aladdin, and uh, everybody else was working on Beauty and the Beast. And so uh, they had me do a variety of animation tests. So the tests you'll see here first are one for Abu, one for Iago, and it was a different Iago. It wasn't Gilbert Gottfried. It was, it was the concept was that he was going to be a regular ah, parrot, you know, when you were looking at him. And then when the door was closed, he became very eloquent and British. Um, and there's a test of that. And then this is followed by three tests. Uh, they said, well, why don't you take some of Robin's comedy album stuff and animate a genie to it? So uh, that's what I did. And eventually, they had not signed Robin Williams, but they brought him in to look at these tests. And I have to say, it's one of the great pleasures of my life to have made Robin Williams laugh. Anyway, these are the tests that everybody saw, including Robin.
there's no justice. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny though if I was just a hologram and went... <laughs> Could scare the shit out of a lot of people here. Once again, if there are any little children here tonight, we've used these words in a sentence. I don't care, it's still stupid. But first, before we do the play, I'd like to talk about the very serious subject of schizophrenia. No, he doesn't. Shut up, let him talk. I'll take that all back. <laughs> Don Ernst at the time, who was who was one of the co-producers on Aladdin, we went up to do Robin's first recording session at Skywalker Sound up in Marin County. And what we didn't expect when Robin got in front of the mic was not, you know, John and Ron had written the role as archetypes. Okay, he's an evangelist here. He's a game show host here, et cetera, and so forth. But when Robin's in front of the mic, out comes all these celebrity impressions. Out comes Groucho and Peter Delari and, and W.C. Fields and everybody. And yeah. aside from cracking us up, you know, we get back after the session. We go, we can't not use this stuff. We yeah. have to use this stuff, yeah, you know. Yeah. And to a certain extent, it was fun in that I felt like it was a very, very new kind of humor that Disney hadn't traveled in before. Right. It was very extemporaneous yeah. and very contemporary. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, I remember talking to Mark Davis, and he, he had a, a, you know, although he liked the genie, he was saying, you know, that the humor was too topical. Uh, I remember. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of talk about the that. same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, they thought it was too, um, too modern. Yeah, well, yeah. in the meantime, I, I'm thinking, you know, well, you still got Pinocchio with Honest John talking about the flat foot Fluji with the Floy Floy. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's plenty, you know, there's plenty of contemporary things. references and even contemporary voices. The fact that they cast Cliff Edwards as Jiminy Cricket you know, he was like a rock star then. You know, he was a very <laughs> popular recording and radio star right. then. Which is you why know? Walt did it, right? Uh, yeah. So it, it's it's like, don't tell me you didn't have contemporary references. You know, that you guys absolutely did. Right. And I have to admit, too, both John and Ron and myself looked at what Robin was doing and what we were going to try and do with it visually not unlike a lot of the classic Warner Brothers cartoons as well, which we also love, and thinking, okay, you can watch a Warner's cartoon from the 40s, and you may not get who all the caricatures are. You know, you may not get that it's Greta Garbo or Clark Gable or, you know, anybody else that they're yeah, caricaturing. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And yet, the films still hold up. And to a certain mm -hmm. extent, they act as time capsules for that period. And so we kind of thought this was our kind of time capsule for this period, you know, in the early 90s in that same vein. Whew. All right. Long video. Sorry about that, guys. We just had so much to talk about and there was so much information to go over. Despite that, this is just the beginning of his career at Disney, where he still works to this day. But as you can see, we are way over time. So sit tight and tune in for part two to see more of Eric's very impressive career. And what you can do while you're waiting is you can go watch Raggedy Ann and Andy, uh, The Musical Adventure. It's a really beautiful film. It's strange, but my goodness is it beautiful. And we hope you enjoyed it. We worked really hard on this one. Thank you for watching this episode of Dizographies. Click the thumbs up button below if you liked it. And if you want to be notified when the next episode comes out, consider subscribing. Comment below with characters you would like to see us cover. Further reading and references are linked in the description. We hope to see you in another Dizography.